Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here. There is lightning and thunder outside. I'm up watching videos on the Thundercats. I've seen some good roasts from our boy, just some guy, and some think pieces by Doug Ernst. And I have stumbled across some YouTube gold. Someone has uploaded an old behind the scenes documentary called Thundercats Ho, creating a pop culture phenomenon. And I keep hearing stuff in this behind the scenes take that is fascinating from a storytelling perspective and an art artistic perspective and thundercats is not even my thing i just completely missed the boat on thundercats it was always one of those things where i said oh you know if i've got a weekend to kill maybe i'll watch a few episodes i am gonna watch the original thundercats now i'm probably gonna watch the 2011 thundercats because i just keep seeing things in this that make me say wow this is what passion looks like. This is what vision looks like. So I'm going to show you just some highlights from this documentary and give you my thoughts and perspective on it. My father first talked to me about it fairly early. He said, what do you think of Thundercats? And I said, Thundercats? What is a Thundercat? <laughs> And the first thing I remember him telling me was I had this idea for a series that involved superhumans that had the form of cats, what parts of them were going to be animal, what parts of them were going to be human. But he would put that down when he pitched it. And it was kind of like I say, Thundercats, Thundercats, Thundercats. And after a while, it really started saying, yeah. I love this. He's talking to his daughter about what he's creating. Look at this concept art. There's variety. Every character, you can tell what their personality is just by looking at them. It's conveyed in the image. I'm going to skip over some of the stuff with them talking about Rankin Bass. I know them from The Hobbit animated show. You probably know them from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. They, they've created a lot of some really quality cartoons in America's history and some cheesy ones too. And in the process of developing other shows, um, we were being pitched ideas by Leisure Concepts Inc., this design firm. They would come up with ideas and present them. And I remember Stan Weston came up, and I forget exactly what he was pitching to us, but I obviously wasn't too interested in that. I looked over at his portfolio, and there was this design in there of this half cat, half human thing. It was just this incredible piece of artwork. And so I sort of wandered over and, and took it out of his portfolio. I remember Jules looking at it, and you could just see his mind just off to the races. Uh, everybody was gone. Jules was there alone. And uh, he had an easel set up with some posters of uh, cat people. There was the panther man and the tiger man, that sort of thing. There was also, oh, what turned out to be the thunder tank. The best thing about it was the, the logo, the lettering on the logo was just sensational. So he said, can you do a treatment? So I said, uh, when, when do you want it? And he says, tomorrow. <laughs> the lettering on the logo. Details matter. Read some of Stan Sakai's introductions to his Usagi Yojimbo books. He got opportunities based on being a letterer for Stan Lee, and that opened doors for him. The little details matter in your craft. Jules, in the begin very beginning, said to me, what you have to understand about animation was that, that whatever you can imagine, whatever you want, you can do. You just have to write it. We were a bunch of guys sitting around a conference room table saying, okay, okay, well, they're in this new place called Third Earth. They're gonna have to move around. We gotta have this thing called a thunder tank. And then, okay, well, they, maybe they can't just go to the gas station, so we have to invent this thing called Thundrillium that the thunder tank runs on, and they can't find it. So what, what you must do is open your mind to anything. So I, it never occurred to me that, you know, we couldn't have an Egyptian character with a spaceship. Why couldn't we have thunder tanks? As long as you could somehow fit it within that format. They recognize that if they can write it, they can do it. Even on a limited animation budget, they can draw things into life that Hollywood's big bu budget special effects teams would have to spend millions upon millions to do. And they're collaborating together. This is great. The vision of the show that uh, Jules had was a very clear, clean action adventure show with a very clearly defined comedy element. 
I think they had very clear visions for each of the characters. I remember there was no question there was going to be a good guy girl. This is like the most mom thing ever. <laughs> And so we created Chitara, and of course there were a lot of a lot of jokes to me. At first they didn't want to give her a weapon, they wanted to put her in the lair's kitchen, and thank God they were joking. People who tell meaningful stories can have a sense of humor, and she gets the hu sense of humor of it all. And Lionel was a learning experience. He's just learning to be a superhero throughout the things. I think the idea was to give the audience a, um, a model, somebody that, that the audience could identify with, like an older brother, who has to go through the process of growing up. This is why stories like this have meaning, regardless of silly 80s pew pew lasers flying around or goofy comedic side characters. You identify with it because it's about growing up and becoming responsible. I am loving this thunder in the background. I hope my mic picks this up. Ancient spirits of evil transform this decayed form to Mumra. Oh my gosh, this was a cartoon? There had been many parents groups that had been campaigning against cartoons on television. They were considered too violent for kids. So this next bit is important. And I didn't catch this in the 80s, but I felt some of this. You know, the TV rots your kids' brains, kind of video games turn them violent kind of vibe. And they were aware of this in the 80s. Uh, Looney Tunes would get flack like this. Oh, Looney Tunes is teaching kids to be violent and stick dynamite into other kids' faces. So they are considering this. Now, are they dismissive and smart-alecky about parents' concerns? They are concerned about parents, and they are making a pitch to parents. So this says, Thundercats, the show you'll want your kids to watch. Discover the one thing missing from children's fantasy reality. Now, this is a bit of a heavy-handed pitch to parents, but they are vocalizing their storytelling concerns, the morality of storytelling. You barely see it, but the one on the right says, if your kids tune you out, have them tune this in. Respect for parental authority, respect for the people who raise you. Oh my gosh. I'm going to read this copy to you since it flashes across the screen really quick. Introducing Thundercats, filled with all the action and adventure your children love. Yes, kids love. You ever heard a kid tell a story? There's like dinosaurs eating trucks and spitting people out all over the place. But it also has something else. Lessons about respect, friendship, honesty, and justice. Thundercats teaches your children the same morals and values you do, and that's something you'll love. We can't have a shared culture or shared adventure stories if we do not have a shared sense of what is right. And in the 80s, they were able to evoke that, connect with that. Uh, Lion O uh, was the youngster. And so it was, it was somewhat about the more mature characters, like Tigra, giving him guidance as we went. We had to settle on how these characters not only were going to sound, uh, but what their attitudes were going to be. I wanted Tigra to be a real guy, a man's man. And so he would help Lionel develop as a, into maturity. <laughs> so I would sometimes when I listened to Tigra, I said, boy, this is a square dude, kind of, you know? <laughs> Some of the stuff about voice acting is a little bit off topic for me, which is why I'm encouraging you to go watch this original, but listening to some of these actors talk about their characters really struck something for me. After I did just a little initial hot take video on Thundercats Roar, I did a very spur of the moment drawing video where I just started drawing these characters and I pretended, what if I'd been asked to make the Thundercats more cute and kid-friendly, but I didn't want them to be off-putting or just purely silly. And as I was drawing them, I was guessing at 
what these characters were about. And I was able, without watching a single episode of Thundercats in my life, to correctly guess most of the vibe of these characters. Somehow that was communicated to me that Lionel is sort of the young person uh, growing up and becoming the leader. I somehow knew that uh, the tiger was more masculine and more experienced. I somehow knew that the panther was the big strong guy. Their visual design is so solid. I, not watching a single episode of this show, I was able to pick up the basic idea of these character archetypes. This is great design. I should have known the Terrator didn't mean us any harm when the Sword of Omens didn't obey me. And anyway, it was just plain stupid to assume it might be bad. Just what am I talking about? That one caught me by surprise. The thing with Franken and Bass was they made very early ties with Japanese animation studios. They did it first. They just knew that there was a lot of talent in that country that could produce this animation. Arthur was the one that worked more closely with the designers and uh, basically helped Masaki Izuka for Thundercats create his studio, which was really, we joked, it was Rankin Bass East a lot of the time. Pacific Animation Corporation was what he formed and uh, we used them uh, in our animation process. They're very talented people and um, we always welcome suggestions from everyone in our group. And as you know, no film is made by one person. Everyone has some input. So we depended a lot on Pacific Animation Corp to, to you know, carry the ball. And of course, you know, you can't tell from a drawing the way people walk. They did all that. They created all that. They brought them to life, basically. Well, I was not expecting this to turn into a top 10 anime fit. The style of animation was beautifully Japanese. I mean, it was anime. and. Um, it was even before the American audience fell in love with anime. That's like the most mom way of saying anime ever. <laughs> Can't. Wow, Thundercats. I mean, it was just right thing at the right time. Everything just was working together behind the scenes and then on the screen. And for some reason, that just ended up magic and set us apart. We just made what we had to make, you know, for the, thinking they would be good and not knowing the longevity of, of anything. Why do certain pictures last so long and others come and go and fade? I don't think any of us know the answer to that. But I guess we must have uh, felt the pulse then uh, and, and it's still continuing. So the voice actors go on to tell other interesting little stories and anecdotes about what it was like behind the scenes. But I think I've touched on most of what I, t what I wanted to talk about from this little documentary. Fabulous. Oh, I am so stoked to go back in time and watch me some real Thundercats. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. I'll catch you later.